I'm not used to getting uh, welcomed like that before. Um, so thankful to be here uh, this morning with you. Um, so blessed already to be able to worship with you, uh, to sing the, the things that we've already sung. Um, I'm blessed beyond belief. So I, I thank you as well. This is the third time, I believe. Maybe it's more. I think it's the third time, <clears throat> pardon me, that I've been here at Toronto West. And uh, that's, that's a big deal to me. I'm very thankful. I'm starting to recognize some of your faces. Maybe more of you are recognizing me. Um, it's great to be part of family here. I'm so thankful for Jason, his ministry here, leadership here. And so, so thank you. So I could do this for you guys. So thank you. Uh, let's, uh, before we go any further, let me, uh, let me pray. So, Father, we come before your word, and, Father, so thankful to be gathered here uh, in your name. And so, Father, not another name. We come and are gathered here to lift high the name of Jesus, to proclaim that name. We've already sung, Lord, we're anticipating uh, hearing from you. Father, we're anticipating you being here with us, and, Father, anticipating your quick return and saying, Lord, Jesus, come soon. And so, Father, with this time that we have, we pray that we would not uh, take it lightly. We pray that you would uh, waken us and stir us and move us. We pray that it would not be possible to be under your word and be unmoved. So, Father, move. Would you be glorified in this time? In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, I want to invite you to turn uh, in your Bibles to the book of James. That is the biggest screen I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> How's that for PowerPoint? Hey, the book of James. You should be able to read it on the screen. Uh, the book of James, uh, chapter 2 this morning. We're going to be looking uh, at verses 14 uh, to 26. And so James is, uh, there's a big book there, Hebrews, just after that. James chapter 2, uh, 14 to 26. And so uh, let me read the passage and then we'll dig in together. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from, apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And in the same way was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by one another. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. Uh, this morning, I want to open with uh, the two questions we just read there, the two questions that James opens with this morning. And the first is this, and in verse 14, he says this, What good is it, my brothers? So question one is this, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? What good is it if someone professes Christ outwardly, he says, but has no proof? Well, we would say this morning, perhaps, that's not ideal. That's not maybe God's best, but that's better than nothing, would it not be? We'd say at least they, they're a churchgoer. I mean, at least they believe in God. At least they believe in Jesus. I mean, they mean well. Faith without works, yes, but, but I mean, I've talked to them once before about the Lord I know. And, and you know, James, you would, you would just have to give them a break because they're kind of young. I mean, they're too young. I mean, they have faith, but come on, be easy on them. They're just a teenager. Or maybe they're too old. I mean, they're in retirement now, and yes, they have faith, but, but without works? Not doing anything and yet saying that we have faith. James asked this question for a reason. He asked a second question, and it's a sobering question as well. He says this, verse 14, can that faith save him? Can faith without works save you, he says. 
Well, of course it can. We think Ephesians 2, 8 to 9. We know this, maybe many of you have it memorized. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of work, so that no one may boast. So there it is. There it is, of course it can save you. It's maybe not ideal, but it certainly can save. We're saved by, by faith alone, right? Grace by faith alone. So if that's the case, then maybe this is one of those guilt sermons. I mean, maybe James was just laying it on to the people, and it really didn't matter, but he was just bringing some guilt to try to stir up some works. And I want to say this morning very clearly that James was not giving a guilt sermon, and this is not a sermon to guilt you into works. This is, in fact, something um, far more important than that. James is, in fact, not asking questions. James questions quite a Often through the book of James are rhetorical. He's not really asking a question here. He's making a point. James asks these two questions to make a clear point. And the point is this, is that faith without works is dead. It's dead. Now this, this time that we have is not a call then to, 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 to necessarily stir up more works. It's not a call just to, to do more things. It's actually a call to test your faith, to test your faith and see if it actually works. And so that brings us to, to uh, three questions I want to ask then to test our faith through this. We started with two. I'm going to bring us through the text and look at three in particular. Is your faith dead or alive? Well, here's three questions we want to ask to test that. And the first is this. A dead faith is useless. Is my faith useful? A dead faith is useless. Is my faith useful? In verses of 15 to 16, James gives us a scenario to help us understand um, just how um, useful or not useful your faith should be. In verse 15 to 16, he says, and you can see it there, if a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace and be warmed and filled, Without giving them the things needed for the body, he says, what good is that? He basically says, that's crazy. That's like if you have a doctor. If some of you, um, you have an accident after church and you have a wound and you go to the doctor and he says, man, that is a nasty wound. You're bleeding. I want you to be at peace. And you're thinking, oh no, this is really bad. I want you to be warm and well fed. Be blessed. And the wound is still there. We would say that is the craziest doctor on earth. James gives a scenario and he says, this is crazy talk. No one does this. No one sees someone that's hungry and thirsty and says, I work at Valley Village. Be at peace. I work at the food bank. Lord bless you. Off you go now after church. And just know how loved you are. As we often say at the end of the service, right? James says, no, that's, that's absolutely crazy. And he says, it's, it's in fact, what good is it? What advantage is that, he says? What advantage? So the idea is, does it add anything? And the answer is zero. It adds, it adds this much. It adds nothing to your faith. He says that's nothing. It's like if you've ever had, um, wake up in the morning, and if you ever had this before, you wake up in the morning and you have an, an arm that's asleep, you've got a limb and it's not working. Have you had that before? Anyone had that? Okay, maybe you've heard of someone that's had that. I've woke up before, literally looked to see if my arm's there. I cannot feel it at all. It was in college once. I'm trying to shut off the alarm. I shared a room with a roommate, and I'm doing everything I can to make this arm, never thinking I could use my left one to shut it off, using my right arm to try, and I'm using my left arm to make my right work, and there's nothing there. My arm is there, but it is a dead arm until the blood starts flowing and comes back to it. James is speaking, it's interesting, if you look at verse 14, James is speaking to believers. He says brothers. We often take this and say this is just purely evangelistic, this passage. It's not. I mean, it is in many ways, but it's not. It's for the brothers. And he says, look, many of you, your faith is useless. You have an arm and there's nothing, there's nothing to it. It's like a dead arm that's asleep. And he says, wake up. A portion of your faith may be asleep, may be dead. So as Christians, for myself, I've been challenged in this as I've been um, working through this this week. 
How many times have we said to people, maybe not these exact words, be at peace, be warm and filled, but how many times have we said, you know what, I'll pray for you. And then there's, there's no prayer happening. Um, I've been challenging this before. There's many times if I say I'm going to pray for someone, I pray on the phone with them. I pray right there for them because I will not remember after. I'm not content to say be warm and filled and at peace. We're going to pray right there. Um, how many times have we said, you know what, let's get together. And we should get together sometime. And we mean, we mean well. We've got a smile on our face and, and in our hearts we really do want to get together, but nothing happens. James says that's useless. That does nothing. We have a neighbor that's unsaved. We talk about loving our kids or our spouse the way that we should, but nothing happens. There's many things for us, I'm convinced, and James wanted us to see this, where we need to come to action. We need our hearts to be stirred, and we need to do things because that's what faith does. It's not meant to have an arm that's not working and asleep. So James is warning the believers, but for sure he's also warning those in their midst. I'm certain there are some in our midst this morning, and I'm, and I'm praying for you as well, that they would see, look, you think that you have faith, but it's dead. Is your faith useful, James saying, is saying to you. He's saying, is your faith useful? Will it save you? So I want to give a, an illustration to help kind of flesh this out for you. Anyone know who uh, Garbage Man is? Have we seen garbage trucks go by before? I'm not from Toronto, so I'm pretty sure you guys have garbage, and someone picks it up, right? Yep. Is that true? Yes? You got blue bins. I actually lived in Oakville for a little bit of time, and we had, for the first time in my life, blue bins and garbage bags in certain days, and I can never figure it out. I don't know when to put them out. You just kind of put them out all the time and just hope good things happen. <laughs> I want you to picture a garbage man, okay? You've got a garbage man, and this garbage man is the most passionate garbage man in all of the GTA. I mean, you talk to this man, and you met him, let's say, this week, and he tells you about garbage. And this man knows when the blue bins go out, and he knows when the garbage bags go out. And this man understands garbage trucks. He can fix his own truck. He owns his own truck, in fact. He talks about his truck, and just tears stream down his face. He's so filled with emotion and joy, and he talks to you, and he says, you know what? I come from a family of garbage men. Generations and generations we've been picking up garbage in the GTA. And you think, wow, this is amazing. But he never gets out and picks up your garbage. In fact, he never goes anywhere. He never actually fires up the truck and goes down the road to pick up your garbage. My question is this then. All his passion and all his words and all his knowledge and the experiences that he's had, is he still a garbage man? I would say no. I would say no, because you can't separate the two. And James is asking this question of us. He's saying, you can profess Christ. You can be passionate and have tears stream down your face when you speak of Christ. You can have generations of churchgoers in your family. You could have been here for the church plant, the start of it, launch. Share experiences of emotional, even supernatural events that have happened in your life. Maybe even things where you've seen answers to prayer. But unless the work of your life is for Christ, then your faith is dead. James says, if there is no work for Christ, then your faith is dead. And he says, it's useless. Unless your, your faith is about pushing forward the name of Christ. And not necessarily, I'm not talking about perfection here. I'm talking about the heart of everything you do. Examine your life and say, is the core of who I am, is it about pushing forward the name of Christ? Is it really about doing work for him and for his kingdom and his glory? Where am I putting my resources, my time? Who am I working for? And I would say if you're not, then the question would be like the garbage man. Are you really a Christ follower? Are you, are you really a Christian? This is what James says. He says in verse 17, and James uses strong language here. He's not watering it down this morning. He says, so also, so also. He says, what, what good is it? What advantage? And then he says, so also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. And a dead faith is useless, and a dead faith can't save. And so we test this. We test this with the first question, is my faith um, 
useful? Is it useless? Is my faith useful? Second is this, a dead faith is demonic. Is my faith any different? Is my faith any different? Now, we understand from James that uh, faith without works is dead, right? Period. There's no really question. James is like, ah, except on Tuesdays. It's like, no, it's, it's dead. That's it, period. But there's always someone, isn't there? There's always someone that kind of rises up and they have, a, they have a rebuttal to that. And they say, well, I actually kind of oppose that. And this is what's happening here. He says in verse 18, but someone, okay, someone will say, look, you have faith and I have works. They're saying, you know what, I'm more of a book guy. Someone says, look, I'm more of a, a book guy. No, I'm more of a hands-on guy. I like to kind of get my hands dirty, like to like feel some, you know, blisters on my hands. That's kind of me. No, I'm more in the library. Someone says, no, I'm more of a rule follower. My wife is tendency is more of a rule follower for sure. I'm more of like, ah, I think we can do this. That's all right. Right? You would say, well, I'm more of a, a lover. And someone would say, I'm more of a fighter, right? More of a fighter. I'd say, well, this is kind of just who I am, Kyle. I'm more of um, into the emotional experience of Christ. I just I love that 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 personal sense. I'm more of no theology, and and James is saying there's always someone that comes up and says these things, and they try to separate this. But James says you can never separate. You can't. You can never separate faith from works. Why? Because if you separate it, it's dead. Amen. It's dead. If I if I take my arm and separate it from my body, it's not just asleep anymore. There's a problem there is dead. And that's what James is saying. Verse 18, this is why James says, he says, show me. And, and the language he uses here is, is basically saying, look, show me. Like, where is it? Show me. You know, you, my, my kids picked berries the other day. All right, show me. Where's the berries? Uh, we did it. Where's the berries? Where's the bucket? You know, there's jam all over their face, right? Show me. James is like, look, then show me. Right away, your faith, and look at verse 18, he says, your faith apart from works, show it to me. And I will show you my faith by my works. He's basically saying, where's the proof? It, my daughter uh, plays piano. Okay, she's a piano player. So you can take my word for it, or I would have to ask you over to my house, and you'd have to watch her play the piano, right? you would have to see a video on your giant screen <laughs> of her recital and she's playing the piano. Why? Because she's a piano player. What do piano players do? They, they play the piano, right? This is the proof of it. And James is saying, it's, it's in some senses that simple. He's saying, you, you have faith? Then you show me. Then you show me your faith. And almost again, James uses that, that kind of rhetorical uh, language, that sarcastic language. He says, go ahead, show it. Show it to me. It's impossible not to, uh, to separate the two. So James is looking for proof. Why? Because faith without works is dead. And if you think James is not serious about this, um, look at what he says. Look at what he says in verse 19. The language couldn't be much stronger. You believe that God is one. So now he's speaking to their, in a sense, their heart, their head. He's saying, okay, you believe this. You do well. That's good. And then he says, even the demons believe and shudder. Now, I don't know if you I noticed this, but uh, he's quoting here Deuteronomy 6.4, which back in the day was the equivalent to uh, John 3.16. So I want to I just try to do a little test this morning. Okay, John 3.16. Um, and for me, it's going to be King James. That's how I memorized it. Okay, but let's, let's try out loud right now. John 3, 16. Let's see if we can do it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Man. That's amazing that that many of us can hear this. John three sixteen, And I can hear sorry, the voices and know that we have this memorized. This is what James is quoting. He's saying, hey, John 3, 16, you guys know Deuteronomy 6, 4. Okay, Deuteronomy 6, 4 says this, and we probably couldn't um, say it like that, but this is what was being said there. He says, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Okay, so this is what James is saying. He's saying, look, you know, you believe this, you've heard this, you have this memorized. But he's saying, where's the proof? Where's the proof? Because if there's no proof, 
You're not saved. I had um, a friend that's a real, uh, some background. Uh, my family and I moved three years ago from uh, out west. And uh, I got word from the church that we had come from that Mike, who had gone there, Mike was a professing Christian. Mike actually was a real pro-creation versus evolution guy. And, I mean, Mike knew his Bible for sure, but something was off with Mike, and we always were very concerned because of the, the, the fruit of his life. Now, Mike was reading his Bible, and this was now maybe only six months ago. He's reading his Bible in his kitchen. So there you go. He's reading his Bible, and he's going through the book of John, and he is struck at a moment in the kitchen reading, and he says, I don't think I'm saved. Turns to his wife, he says, I'm not saved. And he repents of his sin and trusts in Christ and gives his heart to the Lord and is saved. How is it that Mike grew up in the church his whole life, even fought for, hey, this is what the Bible says about creation, reading his Bible in his own time, and he's not saved? You know what happened with Mike then is right away, he repents of his sin. He prays there in the kitchen with his wife. Like a week later, they're on holiday, and he's in a church, and it's, it's not his church. He's a, he's a guest there. He's just sitting there, and they have a baptism service. He's like, I know the Bible, and I need to get baptized, and he gets baptized that day. He starts studying to go to seminary. He's reading books like crazy. He's witnessing to his family. He's absolutely changed. He's absolutely changed. And so the question I want to give you and what I believe James gives us is this. Maybe you believe in God. Okay, like Mike. Maybe you believe in God. The demons do. You believe in God and you've believed in him as, as long as you can remember, not as long as the demons. You know your Bible. The demons know it better. You've heard a hundred sermons. The demons have heard Christ himself preach. You fear God. The demons believe and James says they shudder. The demons are so scared of Christ that the, the, the shuddering, what he's speaking of, is like bristle. The hair on the back of, of their neck goes up when they hear of Christ. They are terrified of him. So you fear, you fear, the demons fear more. This is what James is telling us. This is why he's using this comparison. But here's the thing with the demons, is the demons are still enemies of God. They have, in some senses, we would say, high-level faith, and they are enemies of God. They have not bent the knee. They have not submitted their life. They are not living to proclaim and push forward the glory of Christ. But they are scared of him, and they do know a lot about him. And they know this Bible better than I do. But they're not saved. Mm. Have you repented of your sin? Have you given your heart to Christ? Have you trusted fully in the substitutionary atonement? Him, Jesus in your place. Have you fully surrendered to just, yes, I believe in Jesus and you prayed a prayer, but it was for something else. It was, it was, it was just a thing or it was an emotional thing. I'm, I'm telling you, test your life. Is your faith any different than the demons? Faith without works is dead. And it's no different than the demons. This is the warning to the unsaved. And to the believer, I believe James gives another warning. To the believer, uh, James is telling us uh, the same thing he, he told us with the, the scenario that he gave. Is your faith useless? Is it dead in that sense? He's saying now, is it, is it demonic? Is it dead in that sense? Are there, are there areas? So I'm, not, I'm saying to, to the saved here, the ones that have true faith, but you have portions of your life where your arm's asleep, where it's as if you are dead. And James is speaking to the brothers and he's saying, so, so are there areas of your life where you're, you're walking in known sin? You've been confronted by a brother or sister and you're saying, no, I know, but I won't. That's too hard. I won't go there. I can't. It's gone on too long. There's no way of changing it. And you're walking, whatever your reasons, you're walking in rebellion, known rebellion. That's an area of your life that then is, is dead. Maybe your worship's off the mark. Man, I've been here so many times. This is almost a daily thing for me. You're consumed with whatever it is, whether it's your sports or whether it's your, your time on the internet or whatever it would be, and you're consumed with it. You're, we're worshipers, and you're worshiping that. Then James is saying, and he uses the language 
for a reason, because there's truth to it. In those moments then, it's as if your faith is, is demonic. It has those, those characteristics. It's dead. And so he's calling to the believers and he's calling for us to, if there's sin that you're clinging to, he's saying, you need to let that go. He's saying, this is serious. This is not the character of our faith. You cannot be content just to say, but I have faith. At least I have faith. You can't be content. You have to say, no. My faith needs to be alive. Every part of me. Every part of me. Amen. So the third and last question I want to ask us this morning is this. So we've said, and, and to be clear, we've said a dead faith is useless. A dead faith is demonic. And last, a dead faith is unbiblical. So the question is, is my faith biblical? Now, James says, and again, it's almost, you can, you, can, you can hear like the intensity and like the temperature getting turned up. He says, look, do you want to be shown as if he hasn't already shown them? He says, do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? And then James gives two biblical examples of faith and works. And so the first example is this, is Abraham. First example is Abraham. Now, um, I want you to... I want you to, to try to, if you're slipping on me at all, and these chairs are, like, ridiculous. So, like, wow, you're reclined, like, they're huge, they're comfy. You need to maybe lean forward, whatever you need to do. Grab someone's hand and squeeze it right now. I want you to pay attention to what James is saying here, because it's very important that you follow um, some of the background of what he's speaking to, so that you can see the weight of what he is saying here. So... He says, look, you want to see that you can't separate faith and works? Okay, let's go first example, Abraham. So here's some background. Back in Genesis 12 and 15, God made Abraham. He used to be called Abram back then, though. He made him a promise. And the promise was that the nations would be blessed through him. Now that was speaking of Jesus to come. He says the nations are going to be blessed through through you, Abraham, knowing this is going to be Jesus, and that Abraham would have offspring as many as the stars in the sky, sand on the seashore. And it's going to come through his son, Abraham's actual physical son. This is where it's going to start from. And this was the promise given to Abraham. And so in Genesis 15, 6, this is what's said about that. We, we give some insight into Abraham's heart. It says, Abraham believed the Lord, and he that's the Lord, counted it to him as righteousness. Now, Abraham didn't move a muscle. Abraham, it doesn't say, and Abraham did this or that. It says, Abraham just, he heard it. He says, I believe that promise. And it was counted to him, not just as, and it looks like Abraham believes. He says, no, this is righteousness. This is salvation for Abraham. This is righteousness. Amazing. Now, Romans 4, 2 to 3 actually confirms this. Okay, Romans 4 speaks of this and says, yeah, that's exactly what was happening. It says, for if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. Well, what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now, James says the same thing in verse 23, but he's referring to a different event. Okay, he's referring to something that happened Take that day, it happened 25 to maybe 35 years later, and it's recorded in Genesis 22. So fast forward, and Abraham and Sarah have a kid, and his name is Isaac, and God asks Abraham to sacrifice his son, Isaac, on an altar. Amazing. And James says in verse 21, and you can see it there, he says, Abraham, our father, was justified by works when he offered his son Isaac on the altar. So what is going on? What is going on? Well, James isn't denying Genesis 15, and I want you to see this. <clears throat> I want you to see it, because he's not denying it. He's actually affirming it. If, if, you can, if you can see it here and look at it, he's actually affirming it. That's why he writes verse 22. He says, you see that faith, and listen, he says, was active along with his works. That means that faith cooperated with his works. It was working alongside. Faith was causing the works. Remember, they can't be separated. This is the theology that we need to have. And he says, and faith was completed by his works. It's the idea of finish the race, okay? It was completed. It's like it finished 
the race. It finished what it started. When Abraham offered Isaac then, it was proof of the supernatural faith that he had in the Lord. It was proof of it. And that's why he says in verse 24, a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. There it is right there. Do you see what he's saying? And in our culture, I think, in the Christian culture, when I came to the Lord, I understood I needed to trust in Christ. I understood that I needed to repent of my sin. I understood that my life would be radically different. I got that. But I struggled for so long with, okay, I'm saved by grace. I guess I have to just do more to be a better Christian. Like, why do I have to do these things? And I looked at it like a burden. The Lord tells us plainly in Scripture, don't look at it as two separate things. They're one and the same. Say by faith for sure, nothing that you've done. Okay, 100%, faith without works is dead. But here's the thing is that we're saved by faith alone, but faith that saves is never alone. Okay, never. Amen. Okay, so we'll say that one more time. Saved by faith alone. But faith that saves is never alone, ever. Because faith without works is dead. So what's the application then um, for us from Abraham's life? Well, here's the first one. A biblical faith waits without worry. So remember God's promise back uh, to Abraham. Okay, remember that. Since the promise in Genesis 15, do you know that it took them 15 years to get pregnant? 15 years. I don't know if some of you are trying to have kids newly married or not. 15 years is a long time. 15 years you're going to be thinking like, I'm not going to make it. I don't even know if I'm going to live another 15 years. It took them 15 years. And then, this is really interesting. Abraham is 100 years old and Sarah is 90 when they get pregnant. The Bible says twice, okay, there's like young, there's old, and then there's Abraham and Sarah, as good as dead. That's what the Bible says. The Bible says they were virtually dead, and now they have a kid. Unbelievable. The waiting here, now picture this, when they have Isaac, the waiting's still not over for them. Remember the promise was that all these nations are going to come through their son? So here's the thing. They're almost dead. They have a kid. Wow. So praise God. What a miracle. But now the kid's got to live. He's got to make it long enough so that he can get married and have kids. That's a problem. I get worried with my own kids. You know, I find I'm too protective. It's like, well, just keep the training wheels on the bike. I know you're 13, but hey, you just never know. (laughs) Some of those turns are tight, right? And so we've got to look after you. And think about it then. Okay, picture their only son. If this doesn't go well for Isaac, okay, if he has a wipeout on the road, that's a problem because they're as good as dead. So you can imagine the bubble wrap. We're going to wrap this kid in bubble wrap. He stays in the basement. We give him food. Sunlight's good. We'll open the curtains once in a while, but not too much. We don't get him sunburned, get skin cancer. Um, we go, right? There's, it's endless. We can laugh about it, but that's exactly where our hearts go, right? That's where mine would go. Amen. Hebrews 11 says, um, Abraham never had that, in fact. Hebrews 11 gives us a sneak into uh, Abraham's faith. Hear this. Hebrews 11, 19. He says, he, that's Abraham, considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead. Abraham's bringing him up that mountain, and he wasn't like, don't stub your toe. Hang on. Whoa, that's a thorny book. No, he's bringing him right up there, and it says here, he's like, even if I go through with this, God will raise him from the dead. That's amazing. So maybe you've been waiting on God. Maybe you've been waiting on God for a long time. And maybe it's not the same thing that that they're waiting on, and surely in many cases it's not. But you've been waiting for a long time, and my question is, how long are you willing to wait? You worry, you feel time ticking away. Maybe it is to get married, maybe it is to have kids. Maybe you're waiting for a trial to pass. Maybe you're just looking for answers to questions and you're waiting and you're waiting and it's not coming. Then how long are you going to wait? How long do you wait? I say you keep waiting. You keep waiting. That's faith. You wait and you're tempted to go into sin. You're tempted to do things your own way, take things in your own hands. And I say, wait, 
Wait. Look at Abraham's life and wait. Maybe you had some big answers to prayer. Okay, maybe God has come through. You waited a long time and now, now it's happened. And you've had some answers. You've had some breakthroughs. But now the worry's there. And you're like, yes, God, but... But what if? And what does tomorrow hold? And I just, I don't know about today. And you feel the weight of that. And you feel the weight of that maybe with your kids or there's something they're going through or a spouse or your own health. And it maybe keeps you up at night. Will you trust the Lord to protect and fulfill his will in your life, whatever it means? Whatever that means, wherever this will take you. And will you keep waiting? We know with Abraham, you may feel you're as good as dead. God raises the dead. So will you wait? And faith calls us to do that even when it doesn't make sense. Second applicational point from Abraham is this. Biblical faith obeys despite confusion. A biblical faith obeys despite confusion. So when God said, sacrifice your only son, I don't know if that's the first time some of you have heard this before. That has got to be in the Bible, uh, top, like number one on the top ten most confusing commands that God has ever given, for sure. Okay, now that's something that they would have known only the pagans do. What's going on? Now, plus, plus this, Abraham's response was probably number two on that list of confusing things. Abraham says he's going to go, go through with it. Abraham, in fact, the scripture says, got up early the next morning. He, did, he set his alarm to get this thing done. He got up early. He could have slept in. I would have slept in. I would have been like, no, I have to eat breakfast first. And I'm going to eat breakfast till like 2 in the afternoon. <laughs> till I can't move. Like we're going to do whatever we can to just delay this day. When, when is it no longer day? Okay, we'll go right, right before sundown. He's up early in the morning. Why? Why would he get up early in the morning? It's incredible. It's because of his faith, right? It's causing him to work. Now, are you facing confusion? I mean, obedience is easy when it makes sense, right? Obedience is easy when it makes sense. But you really find out what, what you believe and what we believe when the heat's turned up, right? And when things are confusing and don't make sense, and you're in turmoil and you're just confused, that's when it's hard. Maybe there's been a tragedy or a loss, a brokenness in your life, Again, maybe a sickness that just remains, and it will not get better. And it might not get better. I want to say that to you this morning. It may not get better. And you say, well, if God is good, then what's going on? It doesn't make any sense, and it's not promised to make sense. Sometimes we get to see God's hand in our lives. Sometimes we get to see it. Sometimes you get to look back in hindsight, you say, wow. Do you see how those, or I didn't see it at the time, but do you see how that worked out? Sometimes we see it, and God is good to show us, but not always, and it's not promised. And a lot of times, we don't know why, and I can't tell you why, and you may come to me and say, okay, why, Kyle? And I say, I don't know, and I don't have an answer for you. And sometimes in faith, all you can say is, look, I don't know why, but I know who God is, and I know what he says. And I know what he's commanded. And I know what he's promised. And I will obey him. And I will praise him. And I will persevere. No matter the confusion. And this is the call of faith then. That's the call of faith. It, it, it's interesting to me that God did not test Abraham by asking him a series of questions. God did not give him a questionnaire and say, we're going to just test your faith. Let's see how you're doing this test. See what you know, Abraham. And he doesn't say, he doesn't come up to him and just say, hey, Abraham, do you still have faith? He doesn't do that. How does, Abraham, how does God test Abraham's faith? He puts it to work. That's what he does. And for many of us, we, we don't want to be put to work. We don't want to go there. We're content with what we believe, we think, we believe. And we will not go because we say it's too confusing. It's too hard. I've waited too long. I'm not going there. I have my faith. That's enough. Don't push me. If you knew how far I've already come, you wouldn't push me any further. That's enough. I have my faith. And James says, no, it's not enough. You can't separate it. You can't. You can't. Faith without works is dead. Second biblical and last example that he gives, James gives us, is this. 
is uh, Rahab. He says in verse 25, and in the same way, so here's your second, on the same way was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out one by another. So here's the background to that is, re in, is a reference. I don't know if you knew this. It's a reference to Joshua 2. You can read about this in Joshua 2. Uh, back in the Old Testament. And so what was happening in Joshua 2, it tells us the account of what took place. Is you had two spies. They were sent out by Joshua, the leader for the Israelite army. And they were going into the land to take the land that God had promised them. And they meet Rahab, this prostitute. And they start talking with Rahab, this, this prostitute. And Rahab knows who they are. And, and she's relaying, in fact, to them. She says, can't know who you guys are. We found out later that she actually keeps them hidden and she protects them. And, but she, she says, I know who you are. Okay, it's all over. There's, there's thousands of people in this community and we all know who you are. We know you're coming. We knew the day was coming. We heard about the Red Sea. We heard about the, the, the kings and the cities that you've destroyed and quite honestly, we're terrified. In Joshua 2.11, Rahab says, our heart uh, melted. And there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. So she says, we're scared. And we know this God. We know the power that he has. And she pleads with them to save her and her family when they take over the city. She knows it's happening. Now here's the application for us from from. Rahab's life. And the first is this. Biblical faith leaves a legacy despite the past. Rahab is called, would you love this in the Bible to be called Rahab the prostitute? There it is. Yeah, they put it down that way. That's what she's called, Rahab the prostitute. Now, here's Rahab's life. She was saved. Okay, Israel came. She and her family were, were in fact saved and entered Israel, became part of Israel. She later marries a guy named Salmon and becomes the great, get this, the great, great grandmother of King David from whom Christ comes. Isn't that incredible? Amen. Ra Rahab the prostitute, Ra Rahab's faith called her to action, saved her and her family and changed everything in her life. Radically changes her life to the point now that in Matthew 1, you can, you can see Rahab in the genealogy. Matthew 1, confusing. Okay, what's that about? Man, there's so much grace in Matthew 1. The line of Christ, and she's there, and she's called Rahab. She's Rahab. Now, do you, have, do you have a past? I mean, do you have a title that you think is so marred that it can never be erased? Do you feel like, you know what? I, I come to the Lord now, but, but all the things that have happened in my life, I mean, I'm just, I'm used goods. I'm broken. God can't, if only we could go back, then maybe God could have used me. Do you know that God never says that? God never says, look, we can, we can do something with you. We could have. I mean, we can't now. But we could have if only 10 years ago, if only five years ago, if only yesterday. He never says that. Rahab the prostitute in the line of Christ Amazing. And maybe, maybe you have, you know, just a, a past or, or a weakness or you say, look at my family tree. The gospel faith calls us to trust in Christ. We trust in Christ. And God sees us then in Christ. Brand new. Second and last point from Rahab is this. Biblical faith saves despite popular opinion. Again, I've already mentioned this. There were several thousand people in Jericho. They were terrified. And we know, and Rahab tells us, we read it in Joshua 2. Rahab, Rahab wasn't like, and you know what? I'm not scared. Everyone's scared, but I'm like, what? Like, I'm not scared. Ah, bunch of chickens. She says, I'm terrified. Our hearts melted. I'm scared. I'm very scared. The description, and notice the description of the spies, though, in verse 25. It's the same description that God gives us in Joshua 6. The spies aren't called spies. Do you see that in the passage? The spies aren't called spies. They're called messengers. There was a clear message of judgment that was coming to Jericho. And everyone 
heard the message and were terrified. But only, hear this, only Rahab believed with faith and did something about it. Only Rahab believed with faith and heard a message that wasn't just judgment for her, it was a message of grace. It was messengers, yes, judgment to some, but it was a message of grace to her. She was trusting in God completely. And at that point, do you know when she decided, okay, I'm going to trust in God? You know what? I, I believe in this God. She put, when she hid the spies, okay, she was in the most danger of everyone in the city. Did you know that? At that point, she'd be killed at any time. She's holding these spies. King comes in. Men come in. They find these spies. She is dead. Her and her family are dead. She is at the most danger in that time because of her faith. And the spies, do you know that the spies told her to stay in her house? That's a problem when your house is built in the wall. What happened to Jericho? The wall came crumbling down. That's a problem. Can you imagine? Now, her house must have stayed intact. Now, how much of the wall came down? Obviously, the army came in. She, her house is in the city wall. Can you imagine when the dust is falling and things are shaking and people are screaming and she is, in some senses, still at the most danger of anyone in the city. She's staying in the wall. Don't stay in the wall when it's, when it's falling down. You don't go there. You get out of there. But her faith caused her to stay even when things were, were out of control. Amazing. Now, she went from the greatest danger of all of Jericho to the only one in her family that was saved because of her faith. Now, you may feel um, all alone in your faith. Maybe everything's crumbling around you. There's just chaos. Maybe that's how you define your life right now is chaos. And, and things are, are tough and confusing and, and you're scared. And popular opinion, the groups, the masses around you, are going different directions and you know you need to stay and the opinions around you are saying look do the right thing be wise what are you doing you're crazy just do this look after yourself just go after this thing look you can't do what you're going to do don't you know the stats don't you know if you do that this is what's going to happen and these are the voices maybe around you and now it might be tempting for you to do things uh, your own way then today and, and maybe, you know what, for a day, maybe for a day it'll be safe. Maybe for a day things, the pressure will come off and you'll be like, all right, I'm actually, I think I'm better. For a time, for a time, you get away from the wall for a time, it's not going to last. And God is calling us to faith, and I would say hold the line. True faith, trust in God alone, and does things his own way, even if it means you're going to lose everything. Even if it means, in fact, you will lose your life. You will lose family. You will lose friends. You, you may lose your job. The list is endless. Christ said, take up your cross and follow me so we could do it. Will you have faith? Rahab's faith meant she hid the spies. She stayed put while everything around her literally fell apart. But despite uh, popular opinion, despite the opinions around her, um, she did not look after herself. She looked to the Lord. Abraham and Rahab had faith that actually worked because faith without works is dead. James, I think it's clear from, from as we close here, uh, James chapter two, that everyone has faith. Everyone has faith. Even someone that says, I don't have faith. Well, that's their faith. Their faith is that they don't really have faith. It's true. Everyone has faith. But James says clearly, look, faith, and particularly faith in Christ, faith in Christ is, is dead unless it has works. He closes with verse 26. He says, for as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. So for those this morning, and maybe, maybe there's one or two or a handful, I don't know, but maybe someone here this morning um, has, a, has faith, but it's dead and you're not saved. Your faith is useless. It's demonic. It's not going to save you. Maybe when you hear about the name of Jesus, the hair on the back of your neck does stand up. And maybe it does now. Maybe you, maybe you have stirrings in your heart, maybe emotions, but it must call you to repentance. 
it must lead you to bend the knee to Christ and to fully surrender to him. It must. It has to today. You, you cannot wait on this. If it is true and you truly believe it, then you can't wait. You can't say, I'll wait till tomorrow and then I'll be all in. You, take, you say, I am dead without Christ. I see his glory. I can do nothing but submit to him. Take my life. Take my sin. Forgive me. Give me life. And I would say, you need to do that now. You cannot wait. You do not know what tomorrow holds. And that's not an emotional call. That's, that's a call to what God has said through his word. Do not think, but I know I believe in Jesus. No, I have faith. No, I've been coming for a time. No, I have experiences. Forget those. Faith without works is dead. Come, and the first step is repenting of your sin. Trust in Christ. There is no other God. There is no other name. Christ is coming. Christ alone was on the cross. Not another person, not another man. Man who is man and fully God. And he has taken your place. And he says it is finished. And he's saying, come. Come. Do not let your pride hold you back. Come. The first step is repentance. All in. I'm yours, God, wherever this takes me. And would that be today? So I would call you to that and say, would that be today? And if that's you today, then you need to come to someone after and you need to pray with them. You need to say, look, and you, you find, find a leader in this church and, and say, all right, let's pray. Let me pray. I'm, I'm in. Lord, I'm yours, Christ. And for us that are saved, then I would say this. James is speaking to the brothers. Remember verse 14 in chapter 2. He's speaking to the brothers. And I would say, is there areas of your life where your arm is asleep? Your arm is dead. There's, there's pockets of your faith, not that you're not saved, but pockets of your faith where you're dead, where it's useless, where, as James says, it's, it's demonic. We cannot be content to do nothing. You cannot be content, as I often am, just to be like, well, I've got faith. Praise God you have faith. That's a gift from God. But you, can be, you cannot be content to do nothing. Maybe you've been doing a lot of talking. Maybe then it's time for action. Maybe you're a professional in an area. I mean, you can talk. I mean, you know some stuff. And people know you know. And when you get together for coffee, this is what you talk about. Maybe it's time for action. Maybe there's an area of sin you need to repent. Maybe there's some radical change that you need to make. And you need to move. And you need to give this to the Lord. And you need to repent. Maybe you're confused, alone, or looking um, that it looks like lose everything or time's running out or things are desperate and I would say hold the line true faith true faith waits true faith works true faith does something it clings to Christ and I would say cling and take what's dead and, and allow the Lord to bring it back to life and allow your life then and, and, and this is what I, I would hope you know people often say hey I know Kyle um, you're that guy that hunts right and, and you shot a moose once or something like that. Really? Ah, uh, I don't want that. I, I, want my, I want my life to be, when people talk of me, they're like, he knew Christ. He pointed me to Christ. He showed me Christ. His life was about Christ, because that's what we're saved for. And, and would that be for you, that we take these areas that are dead? I don't want those in my life. I, I want a face that proclaims the glory of Christ. <laughs> a faith that works is dead. But a faith that actually works is worth it all. So let me pray.